that under control. I can basically do whatever I want. Now. Hell oh, yeah, dude. So I've got that. I, I, like you, I don't know if you saw that white panel up at the top uh, in the picture that I sent you, but that's like a battery powered light. Yeah. Um, and then like right now the music is probably pretty loud if Anna's listening it's it's probably um, like quite loud because it's only like a few a few decibels below your volume but I can I can adjust just the I can adjust just the volume of the music now and bring it down I'm getting a uh, echo of my own voice through discord Really? Yeah. That shouldn't even be possible. It's like right when I first start to talk, I'll get a quick pitch of my voice. But, uh... Hmm. It's uh, gone now. You... I'm not hearing anything at the moment. It's really strange. So yeah, I've got the music down kind of low. I've got my mic not quite to the peak but it's i mean it's pretty loud and then when you're talking i think i've got it pretty much under lock and key but um anyways just to kind of some of the changes that i made was um uh, before before like uh, let's see if I can get my mouse. Okay, there's my mouse. So before this, the the my camera was literally uh, the only thing in OBS that was that was on there. Everything else, I literally like I would drag your picture as a picture onto my desktop for the OBS to capture it, and like that was it. That was that was how I did this. And right now, the only thing that's being yeah. captured by OBS physically that I can manipulate is the is the slides everything else is um, everything else is virtual through OBS which I think is a lot easier for me I also have a hotkey on my mouse to mute myself whenever I cough if I remember to do it sweet yeah the the trick is remembering uh, and then I actually, sure that'll still be a struggle. I actually have um, only a portion of this monitor sh streaming out right now, um, so I can actually read your notes without having to like look way over here, or look down, or whatever. Like the yeah. only time I really need to look away at all is if I'm adjusting a volume control or something, or if like we get disconnected on Discord and stuff like that. So. Um, like, I feel like this is, I feel like this is a lot easier for me. I, I'm in, yeah, I'm enjoying the, the setup better and I kind of want to, I, I need to find something to put, um, in this, this area right here. Like for now I defaulted to like a little text file that shows, um, I have a little text file where I keep track in each episode, like how many scenes from the book that I notice and I can update that live and change it. And then, um, total dark friend count, black object count and any forsaken we see, like, I'm just trying to find some things to do visually just so like while we're talking, yeah. you know, like if you have a, I don't know, I'm just throwing shit out there basically to see what sticks. Okay. Um, so let's see that, that first slide was, was kind of a wild intro because I have like, you have no context going into it. It's just Rand wakes up and he's like killed everybody. Way we go in episode two. Okay. Yes. Mm. That was a, uh, Oh, do I need to do to... it? Do I need to do an intro? Well, I mean, you know, we just went from like talking about stream to like in the same flow of sentence talking about the show. Um, 
But that's you know, how I do it. I'm all over the place. I've got some. Uh, uh, that opening scene was pretty, like you said, intense. Um, yeah, at first, you know, you can't tell it. Is he, is he dreaming? Is he in the dream state? Or is this something that's happened? Is he remembering something that they're about to drop to us? Uh, and then you see Ishmael kind of appear out of this smokish material and uh, haunt him in his dream. Yeah. And I feel like it really sets the beginning of this season um, for Rand's mentality and mindset, what he's going through. I agree. I mean, it, it kind of, um, especially like when we go to them a couple of scenes later when he's in the hospital, I feel like this kind of gives you those, that little, um, that little push to kind of see where he's at in his head. So I think this is a good scene overall. Um, I think, I think I need to point out just for my own sanity's sake that I think we talked about this in like episode one of season one, where we're talking about uh, the physical relationship between Rand and Egwene, how that wasn't really a thing in the books, like that never happened. And um, Celine. Celine is they're like they're obviously physical in the show. I mean it's very it gets very intimate and, and even a little spicy. And I, I just I wanna point out that Rand was never physical with either one of these people <laughs> in uh in the books at all. And on a side note, while I was skimming they, do what? I was just saying really that they were never physical. I think, I think your internet is like bogging down with so much right now that it's kind of glitching out at moments mm -hmm. and I'll get like a, an echo of my own voice. I'll, it'll have you talking and then I'll respond and then I'll hear my own voice. Um, but I was just listening to you talk about how they weren't physical and that was pretty shocking because that is the complete opposite of what this show portrays. They are not shy about Egwene and Rand's physical intimacy in season one. And right off the bat, they're jumping right into the sheets in season two with him and Celine. It is, uh, and I feel like they even use that in the show to draw attention because they'll show this scene with Celine. And then the very next frame is, uh, Egwene and Elaine walking. So, you get ran in the sheets with Celine, and the next frame is Egwene. Yeah, that's that was kind of my that was kind of my point is that they're they're very physical um, with Rand, and that it just it doesn't happen. It's it's um, in the books. It's very specific who Rand is physical with, and it has consequences. I, I mean, I can't go into it any further than that, but it's, it's a, that's, that's part of the plot. So them adjusting that kind of plays into some potential plot problems. And that was, you know, I, I, do I care that they changed it? Not really. I mean, it's just, it's just something different, but it does, it does create maybe plot problems that the writers hopefully think about. Uh, the other thing is, yeah. is uh, Rand and Celine in Kyrian doesn't start until halfway through the book. So they've basically skipped from the end of the Eye of the World all the way out to, all the way to halfway through the book. I don't, I don't know if that matters, but like I, I understand the readers. Fresh, like readers that watch the show are probably frustrated that, you know, literally half of the events were just chopped right out. Yeah. Um, but I with, sorry, with no, no, you're fine. Yeah. So just watching the show 
uh, this being the second time through, you know, I kind of know the pace of what the season's going to go. I can see why they would pick the start right here because adding, if they started halfway through the book, adding all that backstory of how Rand got there, how he met Celine, you know, how he ended up in the, I don't, I guess it's an insane asylum that he's working at. Um, that seems like it would take a ton of time with a lot of moving parts to develop in this show. Um, would I have liked to see it? Yeah, I would have. Yeah. I don't know how they could have done it. I mean, I feel like they, they need more episodes. I don't feel like that's a realistic expectation. Um, they're not going to just, you know, hear people's complaints and be like, yeah, we're just going to double the budget and do twice as many episodes. Um, but I did feel that way whenever I watched it. I was kind of... I was kind of left confused. I was like, what happened? How did he get here? <laughs> I was, he's obviously got all these relationships. He's dropping, you know, the coin in the little boy's hand and, you know, getting, I don't know what it was, a tortilla or a falafel or whatever tossed at him from some guy, you know, and you're just like, he's got all these, obviously he's established in this city here. People know him. This is his routine. You know, how do we get here? Um, but a question that I do have that you kind of glossed over, I don't want any names, but up to this point, let's say half halfway through book two, has Rand been physically intimate with anybody in the story thus far through the book? Nope. Nope. I didn't think so. Okay. Well, they got him slinging that thing out here in this show, so. Yeah. He's, uh, you could even say he's slinging the dragon. Yeah. <laughs> Pun intended, my friend. Yeah. I uh, I do like that you caught on that he's established here. I think that's important to what the show is trying to do and him being familiar like with the kid here and mm -hmm. um, being concerned about the guy that he's taking care of in the hospital means that he's been there a while. Right. I mean, he's he's been there mm -hmm. long enough to get familiar with things, build up a little bit of income. Uh, you know, the guard just kind of waved him in. He just a cursory check of his tag. He didn't really have to fight to get in or anything like that. I think all that is is the show trying to say that he's been here a while. And I think that's good. I also think that the show can always do a. um like a flashback of him and you know the woman meeting. Her name is Celine. I I know you know that. I I just uh, already said it, so it's too the the cat's out of the bag. But you know he's already he's already with Celine. He's intimate with her. It's a familiar a familiar enough relationship that that she knows he's having nightmares. You know I think all of that points to he's been there a while and with this person for a while Pretty. and. And they can do a they can do a flashback to they can do a flashback to show how they met if they if they wanted to, um, if they follow anything from the book they would need to show the flashback to answer some questions uh, of the the events between uh, the season one finale and right now and they would need to rehash that a little bit for events in the book later on, if they choose to pursue that, you know, we, we've already talked like, we don't know where the show's going to go. It's kind of up in the air. Yeah. It, it is a bit frustrating that they jumped that much of the storyline. I, I do feel like, yeah, it is easy. The show did a good job. Like you said, of portraying that he's established in the city, but you know, I feel left wanting more, you know, like what, what happened after he left the eye of the world? How did that all go down? You know, you see him kind of walk away. And the next thing we know, he's just established in this new city and hooking up with Celine and, you know, working in the insane asylum with, with a patient that he's clearly got rapport with. Um, even though this dude forgets him every day, you know, Ran has that rapport. So, uh, it it is strange why they would decide to do that. I think it all goes back to pace. They want to increase the pace 
um, that's that's where I'm. That's the direction I'm leaning. What they're doing, I think, is they're escalating all of the storylines that they can, while still trying to capture at least some of the core plot points of the book. And what I think they're going to do is race all the way to the very end, and then try to fill in, like, okay, so they race to the very end. And then while they go, if they have any screen time available, they'll fill it with flashbacks of, of things that were left out. If that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, I took this screenshot mostly because I couldn't remember how to spell Kyrian. Uh, but I, I like it. It's not it's not quite the way it's described in the book. This is screaming like we don't have enough money to build this, so let's you know, let's just do this. But they are showing that the towers are being built and the the city itself is described as like the topless towers of Kyrian. So this is looks like they made an attempt and I you know, I thought it was pretty good. Maybe if you were standing down here they would look enormous. I think just this shot doesn't really do the, the set enough justice. It's supposed to be enormous, like poking into the clouds almost. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're enormous. Like really, really tall power rot towers. Like they had Ogier come out and build them, and they're supposed to be freaking huge. Yeah, that's definitely a... Uh, not <laughs> not that <laughs> i uh i didn't want to be too pedantic i don't mind saying it but i didn't want to go so far as to like go into the book and find the description cuz mm -hmm. i i like the show i do like the show and i don't want to just shit on it all the time so um uh moving on we've got some crazy people and that was apparently the only, that can't be the only shot I took. It was. No way. Maybe because Rand is, ball right here. maybe Rand is just walking in the hallway right now. And we cut back to him in a little bit. It has to be. Yeah, I think so. I think they let you kind of sulk on that for a moment. Yeah. You just yeah. kind of see him fit in this new city and you're kind of wondering how he, fits into this and w what is he doing here why is he in this sane asylum so they kind of break away from it for a second right so uh the nightmare that he ha had with uh with the shamayel and the chick asking him you know was it another nightmare combined with what we heard at the end of season one you know he's in and looks like he's in some kind of asylum and he gets uncomfortable when he sees people like manifesting that. And then we cut over here to um to Moraine. And I'm not gonna spend the whole the whole stream uh shooting on shooting on anything about the show in particular. What I'm trying to do is just point out differences. And like I like I like all this scene, especially uh I think we catch Moraine like Adelius is talking to Lan and uh you sure you don't need more healing and like while she's saying that Moraine's eyes are just rolled up into her head basically like give me a break yep. um I I have I think I've kind of talked about some of the problems with the way the show is dealing with healing I don't know how it could create a plot hole, but this is this is one of the things. Uh along with like the healing without having to touch like Nynaeve did when her in her big burst of power when everybody was like dead. Uh this is the other thing. If you get healed in the books at least, it heals you all the way. There there's nothing wrong with you afterwards. There's no such thing as need more healing. You're either healed or you're not, and um, I suppose there is a case where someone could modulate the healing, but the expertise of the Yellow Aja is not present here with Moraine, if that makes sense. Like, they're off somewhere. 
like a, a healer that could control it enough to, you know, maybe save some of her strength to heal somebody else and they heal two people a little bit, that person is not here and it's not, uh, it's not Adelia's. So I'm, I'm a little concerned that it's going to create problems, but typically if you heal somebody, they're healed all the way. Um, this statement is a hundred percent accurate. Uh, when you get healed, you, <laughs> you get like overwhelmed with hunger because the healing, I guess, uses your, like a, essentially like speeds up the healing process and uses your body to, to fuel it, I guess, more than the power. Uh, but anyways, uh, I thought this was a good scene. We kind of see like this tension between Lan and Moraine. We... We see her being her normal self, like she's, you can see that she, I think she like sticks her hand up to like stop him from helping her. And she's obviously pretty stubborn. Yeah, no, that definitely came across to me that uh, she was still being cold. And it is a recurring theme throughout this episode. She is a bit unbearable. Um, currently in, in her state. Uh, she's gone through a lot, obviously, getting cut off from the one power, trying to find a scheme uh, that she can use for Rand and herself to compete against the Dark One and his friends and try to plot. And so I, I get that she's under this immense amount of pressure, but you would think that... Lan would be her most trusted ally, and she cons consistently pushes him to the side, and it is infuriating to watch that happen. Um, so I guess, you know, they're doing a terrific job of uh, stirring emotion in me, because I get sick to my stomach of watching her act like this to Lan, uh, and he sits there time and time again trying to save her. Uh, she is ungrateful. Luckily, we get a redeeming moment. Um, you know, and we'll talk about that when we get to it, but uh, it is tough to see that she acts like this. Why do you, why do you think she's doing that? I think she's pushing him away. Um, I mean, I, I've already watched this season all the way through, so I feel like, you know, I, it's a bit unfair if I was to make an assessment right now as a first time watcher of this scene. Well, um, I mean, even, even after, episodes, but I mean, even after watching the whole thing, why in this scene, why now, why is she trying to push him away? I think that she, she has to have her, her abilities and her focus be 100% on ran and ran success. I think that Lan can be a bit of a distraction because she cares for him so much. I know things that are going to come out later on. And I mean, it's just a podcast with me and you, you know, like at the end of this episode, when she talks about, um, like Lan asks her, you know, are, are we equals? And she tells him, no, we were never equals. Right. Well, we learned the true meaning of what she meant by that. And I think that that's why she's pushing him away because she can't have that kind of relationship, emotional attachment that she has to land around her where she doesn't know what's going to happen down the road. She doesn't want the dark one to use land against her or him to get caught up in something and she can't protect him anymore. I think she feels responsible to put him in harm's way because she has a job to do to guide the dragon, but now she has no powers. Now she's in a position she can't really protect anybody. She can really only consult. Um, and Lan can really get wrecked being in that path. Especially after you saw what the Dark One did to, you know, Moraine with the flick of a wrist in the first episode. I mean, what could he do to, to Lan who's just got a sword? I mean, Lan is the hands like hand to hand combat the best fighter i've seen in the show so far easily yeah but he ain't got nothing on moraine and the dark ishmael snapped moraine in half like a twig so 
I think for me, that's why you see her push him away, push everybody away and keep them at a distance because she doesn't want anybody to get involved. I think that's, I think that's accurate. I agree with all that. And I think that, I think that the show is capturing the essence of Moraine from the book and delivering that in a different way. Honestly, if okay. book readers are a hundred percent honest with themselves, a conversation like this happens in the, in the books and it's not one for one, but it is pretty close and it is pretty accurate. There's, there's some friction between them, not for the reasons that the show gives, but the friction is there and Moraine has a, a real reason to do it. Uh, not, not related to what's going on right now, but the, the relationship between Moraine and Lan here, the way it's displayed is accurate, not the individual circumstances that led to it, but this friction is real. And, you know, I, that's, that's part of why I like the show. They're going about it a different way. Um, and I'll happily argue with anybody that anybody that read the books that disagrees with me because they're wrong. This this is accurate to their personalities, even if it's not a one for one from the book. Um, I try to capture uh, Uno cursing whenever possible. He quickly is becoming a favorite character of mine in the that's show. A, it's unfortunate. It is unfortunate. That's what I was talking to you about uh, before we started the stream. Well, there are some things that are coming that I'm not ready for. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Um, I, uh, so I have... I have three problems with these these two slides, not problems, just inconsistencies, things that I that I remember that I I wanted to point out briefly. Uh, one, so Uno's complaining that that the sniffer uh, Elias doesn't want to ride a horse. That's fine if they want to keep him slow. Then you take him off the horse. That's fine. But if they do that, then they need to take Loyal off the horse because in the in the books, Loyal hates riding a horse. He always feels like he's going to hurt it. He he's perfectly fine with his with uh, running and walking on his own two legs. And if if Elias is going to be unmounted, then Loyal should be too. That's that's my only uh, nitpick there. You know, I just I want some I like character consistency, and Loyal would absolutely not want to be on a horse if somebody else was walking. Uh, also, we already talked about Elias not actually being the sniffer. Uh, There's a guy called Huron. Uh, and then the last thing is, is I think this is one of the first times we see Perrin with a weapon. Is that, does that ring true to you at all? Uh, no, I mean, we've seen him with the axe. Uh, have we? I'm trying to remember. He oh, did. The, uh, episode did one. Yeah. Uh, very, yeah, the very yeah, first two episode. Rivers. So we saw him there. Then he had a stint with the with the Tinkers and kind of found the way of the leaf to to help him work through his emotions. And right. uh, he was pretty nonviolent for the rest of the season until he realized quickly that uh, if you choose to be nonviolent, people are going to be violent to you, and uh, that's that's not going to work for his path. So you see him pick up a looks to be a katana here or something similar of a sword. Right. Yeah, some, something like I, I just, I don't know what kind of sword it was, but uh, that that explains him not having the axe, because that's what he killed Layla with. Um, it still, it still bugs, it still bugs me, but that's okay. Um, moving on, I do want to point out that this scene, um, not with, not with Perrin, um, but this scene where like the, the violence 
the violence happens inside this room. There's a, a scene very, very similar that happens in the book. And uh, I kind of wish they had, I kind of wish they had done it the way the, the book did just cause it would, it would have been a good visual. There's some, there's some, um, I don't really have a good word for it. There's some inception mind, mind nonsense happening. I was trying to figure out a word without cussing. It's mind fuckery. There's some shit that goes down in this room that I wish they had put on, wish they had put on screen. Uh, and then I think there's some, some tension between, uh, Perrin and, Perrin and Elias. And then, then we find this, the fade nailed up against the wall. That was pretty wild to see on screen. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I think that, uh, it was, it was kind of strange to see you know Perrin I'm trying to think of how I would like to word this but the the relationship between Elias and Perrin is is strange and you can feel that tension when they were coming in to this city but also Perrin's abilities I'm get I'm my, my thoughts are a little confused right now because I'm trying to backtrack over a lot of things we've already skipped that uh had some things I wanted to talk about. Um when Perrin walks into this city, he's like looking through a wall in a closed shutter and says there's a woman in there when there's not. Right. And he feels the presence or understanding of something going on in there. Um and I just don't feel like they really, the show does a good job of explaining what's going on. I mean, we're, we're season two and we've gotten so many glimpses of Perrin and his abilities and we just have no clue what the hell's going on with him. I don't think he has a clue what's going on with himself. Uh, Elias obviously does, but the, the relationship between them two is kind of standoffish because Elias is trying to show Perrin, like, hey, you know, we're we're your homies over here. I don't know why you're wasting your time with these Shenarans, uh, but you should be sleeping under the stars with me. And if I was Perrin right. myself, I'd be like, no, nah, I'm good. I'll take a bed. But, uh, yeah, I just don't feel like we're getting that understanding or, or a moment where there's some clarification on what's going on with Perrin. I feel like they just like to show his abilities, show his eyes glow, his rage him seeing things that have happened in the past, a little bit of minds, like you said, fuckery, or even communication, tele telepathic ability with the wolves. And yeah, it just confuses me and frustrates me a little bit because I just can't, I can't understand what's going on. Um, But yeah, like you said, they walk into the city and they find that fade that was hung up on that door that kind of tripped me out because i did not remember that from the first first time i watched this and i really don't remember if there was an answer that was given of what happened to that fade um but i was sitting here thinking like i can't possibly understand what could do that to a fade it, what would want to hang a fade Unless, no. No, I don't think it would be the people that come at the end of the episode that do it. Mm. I'm blanking on their name. I think. Sorry, go oh, ahead. Oh, the Sean Chan? The Sean Chan. Um, uh, maybe. I I was really hoping for a hot take here. A hot take? Yeah. Well, I mean. Who, who killed the Fade? Who would kill the Fade? Man, who would have a reason to kill the fade? Who you know, would be I a... wanna I wanna say it's my number one suspect, Inktar. Um, you know, he's most wanted number one for me right now. But uh when would I feel Inktar... like he was with his boys the whole time. Yeah, when, so I when would he He didn't have time to do that, I don't think. Huh. 
I wonder. I wonder if Ran did it. Ran? I think Ran would be powerful enough to do that. And obviously, I've missed half a book of him. So, uh, just slinging that thing out there. I, I personally don't think I know anybody else that's just out here roaming these villages that would do that. It wouldn't make sense for Pat and Fane to do it, because that's his ally. I would think, unless Pat and, and Fane's and, playing both sides. And that's could he do it? Like, that's the other thing, because you just said that Rand... Mm -hmm. Rand is the only one you can think of that's strong enough to do it on the forces of good. So, if, yeah, I'm just trying to follow your chain of thought. Okay, so, maybe Rand. Yeah, do you know who does it? Yeah, of course. <laughs> okay. I didn't know if this was something that happened in the book or, or not. Um. It is something that happens Man. in the book, and and just for just for a little um, background, Rand is actually in there in that village with Perrin and Matt in the books. So like they're all together. Okay, so it can't it can't be Rand. Otherwise, it, they would know that Rand did it. It can't be Rand in the books. It can't be Rand in the books. Exactly. Golly, boy, who does it? Oh, Lanfear. That's not a bad guess. It's not a bad guess. That would make that would make sense to me. And you said that Perrin saw a woman. Yes. Like you said that five minutes ago. Yeah. So did he see her in the show? I didn't. I didn't really see a woman. I think I was writing a note whenever I heard him say that. I don't remember seeing a woman. I just remember seeing him look at a wall and a closed door and say there's a woman. Then Perrin walks in here and sees, you know, this mind mirage that goes on of, of previous events. I assume that was the woman he was referring to. Um, but if it was Lanfear in there who was waiting for them to come, this, I figured it out. It's Lanfear. Okay. She's he, ahead of them waiting for, for Rand to come into her come into her trap. Clearing the path for him, so to speak. Okay. Well he Perrin does see a woman. Uh we don't know that it's a woman, but we see like a shadow pass in front of the shutters uh on the second floor. Okay. So we do see something. Um and so, okay, so you're saying that Lanfear is what hurting, hurting Perrin and these guys somehow? Yeah, by I killing... feel like guiding them in a way. Uh, now, if I was to make that assumption off the show, I, w I wouldn't understand that because obviously Perrin and the Shinar and they fall in the hands of the. Give, give me those guys' name one more time. The Shan Chan. The Shan Chan. Yeah, God, is I feel like I'm in Spanish class right now, just like studying vocab. <laughs> There's so <laughs> many names. We could uh, we could pull up the cities and people to remember. This is a lot. Yeah, we could pull up the Silmarillion and try to learn Elvish on stream. No, I'm good, dog. There's a reason I didn't read all that <laughs> that background stuff from Tolkien. It's too deep for me. Um, but yeah, it would it would make sense in my head if I'm just thinking this out if land here land fear was to go ahead of them and she wouldn't want any obstacles in her way between her and rand i mean obviously we're getting into spoilers here but uh this season's been out for a long time so figure it out on your own but that would make sense to me that she's trying to clear the path for them to come to her but right. according to the show the group that goes to that city is gets sent in a different direction. You know what I mean? Right. So I wouldn't be able to piece that together by the show if Lanfear is the one that does it. Or or the girl with the long nails. 
the the Sean Chan lady the with Sean the long Chan nail? Chick. Yeah, I mean, obviously the Sean Chan are in the area. Okay. Hmm. So I didn't th I didn't think about I'm just that as think a possibility. Okay. So. Okay. I I don't see how the Sean Chan could do it because they're pretty like even in the show they're pretty uh bold about like where they are and what they're up to. You know what I mean? Like they Okay. Like does that make sense? Yeah. I don't think I don't think subtlety really uh comes into play here. But I mean, well, any, okay. anything's possible. But that—that's just my take, just based on what I know about the Shang Chan. They're not, they don't really, uh, they don't really do subtlety very well. Well, for me, it makes sense that it would be Lanfear or somebody of that kind of capacity, like a dark friend, or okay. a Forsaken, because. Anybody on the side of good that's strong enough to just hang, you know, an eyeless like that, it, I, I just, to me, I don't think anybody's even in this realm, this area right now. Um, and I, I feel like they would have come into contact with Perrin by this point. Right. And so it makes me think that it's got to be somebody on the dark side. But who would have the motivation to kill one of their own? And that's the confusing part. And for me, it would only be Lanfear. I don't know too much about Pat and Fane. From the subtleties that you're giving me, it makes me think he's not strong enough to do this. So I'm kind of out on that. Plus, I don't see his motivation. But if I know from the book's perspective that Matt ran a pair and raw here, Landfear would have motivation. Okay. Yeah, I I follow what you're saying. I arrest my case. Okay. Hot take. Hot take episode two. Landfear kills the fade. I'm gonna have to record that somewhere. Yeah. Now, now I just want to know if that's true or not. <laughs> I mean, do you really want to know? Like, I mean, I've seen all of season two. I mean, it's not really a big deal in the grand scheme of the story. I know how season two is going to play out. So, I mean, uh, let's, let's see. Was was a hot take right or not? The hot take was not right. <laughs> is it a character that I know? Yes. It was the... Was, was it the was it Elias? No, nah, we're not playing twenty questions because then you could just ask who did it. Yeah, uh, who? I mean, who did it? I mean, in the books, Pot and Fane did it. Pot and Fane did it. Okay, yes. this dude's a savage. He's a sneaky. He's a sneaky one. Yeah. Uh, and I, I couldn't yeah. really. I couldn't really tell if this was like the jewel dagger damage or just they were trying to make it seem like F uh, Fades had black blood. Like, cause yeah. this, this makes it look like it's blood. But this up here looks more like that, that, that blackness that spreads by anything the dagger touches. So I couldn't I couldn't really tell if they were trying to give a clue or not. Why would Pat and Fane kill a fade? I have no idea on the show. Like a, that doesn't make sense. Okay. Okay. I, I know who did it. Keep along. I'm 0 for one today. That's all right. We got we got uh Where I think I think maybe two more. Uh also I don't know if you saw my uh my stats, but uh, I have a total dark friend count for this episode of six. Seeing six dark friends in this episode? Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, should, should I roll call them out that I know? 
See if I can guess a six. Maybe we do that at the end. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, we could do that. Uh, okay, so I think now we're getting uh, back to... This is back at Rand, where we find out that he's clearly like in some kind of asylum, right? The the guy he's talking to thinks that Rand is an Aielman, and he's he's reliving the Aiel attacking Kyrian and punishing them for um, uh, the Aiel the Aiel war. Basically, the Aiel war was uh, pretty traumatic to a lot of soldiers. And uh, so, if anybody knows what an Aiel should look should look like, it would be this guy, right? Absolutely. Uh, and then we, you know, he's talking about vicious fighters, you lot, and then I think they talk about uh, were we fierce, and then were the women fierce, and Errol's like, yes, fiercer, if anything. And I thought that was kind of cool to kind of get some background, some background lore on the on the Aiel in the show. It's is nice to see. Yeah, I enjoyed that, and it's it's cool to see the show keep pointing to Rand being an Aiel throughout the show when you kind of go on that journey to find out his origin. Right. Um, I think, uh, I don't know if I got a, so we talk about the Aiel fighting prowess. So, uh, I saw one cut down a whole brigade on his own. That's, uh, that's pretty big words. We, we don't have a, we don't have a numerical value for a brigade, a brigade, but it's gotta be quite a few. And I, I just enjoyed this. It's it's nice hearing some of the some of the history on screen. Why why wouldn't all the Asadai just go get Aiel warders? There's a very good reason for that. Do what? You just broke up. I said there's a very good reason for that. Okay. Um, but anyway, we also find out in this conversation that, um, this guy, Errol is a, uh, sword, a sword master, a blade master. You know, I think he name drops the Heron Mark blade and, uh, and then Rand is like, you could teach me a few more forms, right? Which I thought was, I thought was cool. And then I made sure I took a screenshot of some of the at least one of the the sword forms parting the silk i think uh, uh apple blossoms on the wind is one there's there's several i mean there's a whole bunch in the barley uh, yeah reaping the barley there's i mean there's way more than just the ones that he mentioned in the in the books they're no. everywhere every time there's a sword fight it's all done with uh, imagine uh, you're using your imagination based on the the sword forms. I like that. I I like it too. Vi like for your imagination, you you do um. You know your your brain kind of fills in the gaps. So like in the books, they're like uh, the the heron the heron strikes the trout or whatever. And so in your, in your mind, you're imagining like a sword stabbing downwards or something like that. And then now whenever you read a sword fight and they're mentioning all these forms, your brain just kind of constructs that sword fight based on that. And I, I like it. It's better than he swung his sword at a 45 degree angle, uh, aiming to cut the, the right hamstring or whatever. So I, I like that. We also find um, right before this, he you know, he's down on the ground. He's upset because that guy, Yan, I guess is his name, is uh, tormenting, tormenting this guy, which I didn't think was very cool. Oh, man. 
My internet is um either. I'm glad he got what was coming to him. That, yeah. that pleased me greatly. <laughs> yeah, for real. Um I am having some serious internet problems. Either that or my computer's melting. That is a struggle. You are consistently uh, breaking up on my end. That's unfortunate. It is. Uh, I'm trying to pull up your next page of notes. I don't. That's not letting me. Um, it's not letting me switch. Yeah. So I could just uh, name off what's next on the on the board. It was uh, Leandrin. Her and Nynaeve are, are together. You can kind of see she's trying to not not train, but maybe take Nynaeve as a apprentice, so to speak. Um, that stood out to me that they had kind of had that big clash, and maybe that's kind of what Nynaeve needed to kind of break through, have her break through in the tower. Right. Um, and it sucks because you don't want Nynaeve to team up with Leandrin, but it's happening. Um, but yeah, that was the next note that I had. And then I'm not really remembering this sh screenshot that you have right here. This is right before what you're talking about. Uh, I think we're just, I think Egwene walks in and is basically like looking for Nynaeve. I think that's the only purpose of the scene. She walks in and she's just looking for Nynaeve. Because uh, then we have here, um, this is uh, the scene right after what you were talking about, where uh, I think Leandrin is taking Nynaeve into somebody who's got a fever, like the, the little girl is, is sick or whatever. That's right. Uh, and I think this scene also happens before what you're talking about, where Leandrin's trying to like, almost like coach and mentor Nynaeve, which I thought was uh, interesting. It it definitely gives you vibes of, okay, well, Leandrin's so hostile most of the time. What's going on here? And, you know, I thought this was, this was cool. Uh, this, uh, this scene right here, I tried to get her where her hand was on it, but she picks up like that poison, the crimson thorn poison. And I was curious what that was for. I think we find out here in a little bit. Uh, and then I, I took a screenshot of this. This is an accepted doing healing. And I thought it was a good, a good call by the show to put the colors on the cuffs. Um, the distinction between novice and accepted in the books is these colors are in like uh, circular bands at the bottom of the dress. And I feel like this is a better call. Hmm. It's more distinct. And I think it visually, it just looks better. Yeah. That, that slipped me. I didn't, I didn't even recognize that. Yeah. When she's doing the healing, it's got uh gray, Gray, blue, green, yellow, and then on her other arm uh, is is the other the other colors. Okay. Um, once again, I'm you know I keep bringing it up, but she's not not touching not touching to do any healing, and that that frustrates me. There's. There's a good reason why I'm frustrated with it, and I can't explain it yet. It depends on what the show decides to do. If, if that makes sense, like I keep bringing it up because it is a, it is a plot point for later in the, in the show if the show decides to pursue it that way. Um, and then I think she talks about, uh, healing breakbone fever took a lot of practice. I'm not sure what she meant by that, but um, I'm hoping she's talking about just the general way to heal people. Uh, if they if they're trying to make it out to like heal 
a cut on the leg is different than a, a cut on the arm or a headache or a fever. I'm not sure how they're going to talk about it, but I mean, this is fine. This is all, this is all just showing Nynaeve like this is difficult. Healing is difficult and trying to reinforce that she needs to learn from somebody. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then I think this is the scene you were talking about. Leandrin actually like, gave us quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of like lore for the Ajas. I think she talks about the Grey being uh, diplomats and the, um, the Browns being like historians and like the the whites being like the people who think logically like that she kind of goes into a few of them and i think she talks about the yellow being the healing aja definitely see a different side of leandrin right here and i feel like she's you know putting on a bit of a face to try to suck in nynaeve you know under her little web of uh bullshit yeah and Nynaeve is Nynaeve seems to be thinking about it she's not yeah, she's soaking it up right now <laughs> she's she's not as hostile towards the Leandrin as when they first met or as hostile as she is to uh Moraine right even with all that they've been through Nynaeve still keeps that wall up with Moraine that's book accurate. Is never just like I feel like relaxed around her. I feel like she's always trying to be like, "What motive do you have? What do you, what manipulation are you trying to pull?" And it's like, "Girl, you are worried about the wrong one." That's uh, book accurate. Nynaeve really, really has trouble letting go of what she thinks Moraine is guilty of, which is pulling all the kids out of the two rivers. Like Nynaeve literally holds on to that throughout almost the entire series. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah. But here I you know, I try to get uh the actresses do such a good job of their facial expressions. This is um right after Leandrin gives her that speech and you can see she's not mad, she's not happy. If anything, she looks um confused about what's going on. Uh, like, why is Leandrin talking to me this way and explaining things to me? And why is some of the stuff she's saying make sense? Basically, is is the read that yeah. I got. Yeah, I, I agree. I feel like I see a face of understanding right there. Like, she's... a realization, maybe right. is a better word. Right. But, yeah. Um, And then... So, we get Leandrin go to pick up some sweet rolls... And then she goes to visit Matt. So after giving that nice speech to Nynaeve, she goes right back to being a giant bitch. And with everything that Matt's been through and the torment that this young man has gone through, he still keeps his sarcasm, which I absolutely love that. Book accurate. Yeah, it's, his... it's terrific. Yeah, she just barges in. He's like, "You could have knocked. Could have been naked." It's like, "Dog, you're a prisoner." <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you're cracking jokes with this chick, but uh, I love it. Love to see it. I think. Um, I think they captured Matt's book quality, like his personality. I think they captured his personality pretty well in this scene. Uh, Matt, here and I'll, I'll just give you a couple, and you just. Tell me after I'm done if the if the show captured it because that's what you were thinking. But in the book, Matt is flip is flippant. He is disrespectful towards Aes Sedai. He's a strategist, and he's uh, very very lucky. Yeah, I would I would have to agree with that. Okay. Well, that's. I mean, that's what I, I, I feel like. I feel like this show's done a lot of good things with these with these characters, and and they do a good job of pulling those emotions for you to root for those things in the character. So not only when they show it, you root for them when you see it. Uh, you know, like you see 
obviously that all the way back in season one where right before Matt takes his dagger when he was told not to touch anything, he gives a, a, a dagger to parent, you know, and right. kind of homage uh, to his d deceased wife. And you see these redeemable qualities in him and then you see him falter in a moment and then you see him hold on to who he is like he's dealing with all this mental torment obviously trauma that he's grown up with and what he's gone through and then the trauma of what he's currently going through right uh, like being possessed by the dagger shatter logoth and now he's a prisoner um you know i feel like he's still kept himself still kept that sarcasm and you see that strategy work King in, in the cell where you know he's building rapport keeping her at a distance keeping things very light uh between him and Le leandrin i right. have to agree i mean that's why i feel for season two i started to like matt's character a lot more throughout this season than i did in the previous one but then again going back and watching season one for a second time it made me appreciate matt even more so I feel like the more I dig into his character, the more I watch him, you know, he, he's got those qualities that I hate, you know, but there's some part of him that makes me like him and root for him. I, I love Matt. I mean, book, book Matt is one of my favorite people, you know, in a book period. Uh, so I really hope they lean into that. I really hope they do. If they don't, um, it would be a, a, a blow to many people that would consider watching the show after reading the books because, um, I mean, even as much as you've read of the book, you're, you're getting like probably like where you're at in the book is probably mad at his complete lowest. So you're not, you're not yeah. getting, you're not getting what we get. The guy, the people that have read it all the way to the end book, Matt, Towards the end of the series is is people's favorites for a very good reason. So I hope they I hope they explore that a little more. Uh, they've got a ways to go until they until they get to where they should be doing that. He's supposed to be like this. I mean, not not trapped in a cell or anything, but he, this this feeling of being stuck is is true at least. And I feel like you see that in season two, and we we haven't got to it yet, but right, he has his that kind of pivot point where, you know, I feel like he's made it through the dark woods that he's been going through for a season and a half, you know, of all this trauma. Like, you know, when we get to the the end of season two, spoiler alert, you know, um, you know, he'll he'll be reunited with his friends, his family and be in a much better place i feel like in i feel like he also realized his past mistakes where he went wrong you know and kind of looking inward in himself rather than relying on his friends around him and i feel right. like that is a overall theme of what you've talked about in the book of how it's a lot of people who think they can all do it on their own in their own unique way and they come to the realization that they need others you know Egwene has or Nynaeve has her own arc with that and we've talked about that in the past and I feel like this is Matt. Matt has all this trauma and all these troubles that he's working through and he decides to look inward at himself and hide right. it and it eats him alive and he ends up in these situations and I feel like at the end of season two you kind of see him break out of that a little bit triumphant. Right. I I just I just want them to keep exploring it. I don't want them to give up. I want them to I, I really want them to not lose uh their motivation for the show because the the quote unquote book snobs won't let it go. I feel like if people took what's going on in the books with the characters and condensed them down into their into their parts they would see that for the most part, the show is doing a really good job of in, of capturing what the characters are like at this point in the story. Um, Matt is a good example. 
Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know how you feel, but it's been like an hour and twenty minutes, and I sure would like to take a little five-minute break. I don't uh, know. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if you're still like. If you're good, but I'd like to go step outside real quick and go to the bathroom and. Um, and pick up where we left off. I've got a uh, where our first look at at the daughter heir. Um, We're back. Really had to pee. Uh, okay, so... 
this is uh, Egwene and Elaine. I don't know if you have anything to say about this. I just thought it was... I'm just trying to take screenshots of like every scene I see, basically. Yeah, I mean, in, in the grand scheme of things, no. Uh, not not with her first appearance. I do think it's notable to, to kind of just point out. Um, but yeah. plot-wise, no, I don't, I don't see the significance. Yeah, we... We can uh, we can skip we can skip ahead as much as you want. I mean, we already have a freaking hour and a half in this thing. It's more than more yeah, than I, I thought we would like talk about. Episode there might two. have been a little bit of foreshadowing uh, that Elaine laid down, um, and I believe it's kind of in this scene right here where they go in the room, and Elaine talks about the Elaine talks about the relationships that have been built by novices that have shared adjoining rooms. And to me, that made me think, what would be the purpose of saying that? What would be the purpose of trying to lay out a relationship connection here? And it made me think that maybe that's a little bit of foreshadowing. Now, I do know what comes later in the season. I have a feeling she's a very important person, especially with her position and power. I don't know how that plays out yet, but to me that stood out. I think that's good. I mean, that's that's what that's one of the things that the show is doing well is like these personal relationships and really really getting the like they're really nailing down that Egwene and, and Elaine have a relationship and it's more than just two novices, if that makes sense. I think it's good. Um, moving on, I I took this screenshot because they mentioned somebody from the books that you know should show up later. The fact that they name dropped her in the show hints that she'll show up. That's uh, Cad Swain. She's uh, I wouldn't say a book favorite, but she's very important to the story. So. I think this is a good hint that we're going to see her if they can find the right actress to do it. Um, Cad Swain Malydrin is... Is she a Shinaran? Or is she come she, from the same place she as is, She is from the Borderlands, or at least close to it. She's... Um, oh, man, I can't, I can't think of the... Um, I can't think of the town she's from. Far Matting is the name of it. Far Matting is the town that she's from. And she's not from the Borderlands, I don't think. I think Far Matting is a little further to the south. But she is a... She's from that area, I guess, that region. I'd have to pull the map up. I just looked at the last name and thought that it sounded familiar to some Shinaran last names. Look at you go. I'm learning. I, I was practicing my words, all right? <laughs> I've only heard a couple of uh, mispronunciations that are going to make it to YouTube, so. I'm, I'm working on it, man. I'm trying oh. to be better. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm basically like learning two other languages currently between college Spanish and this series. Yeah. I'm, I'm doing like 200 vocab <laughs> words a week. Holy but, shit. Uh, this right here. I think it comes up in this scene is a name that I don't think it's going to be something you bring up, but it's a question I had. Mazram Tain? Tame? Yeah, Maz Mazram Taim. They pronounce it different ways. Yeah. I don't remember exactly how they pronounce it in the show. That's the first time I've, I feel like I've heard him name dropped. Right. Um, when they're talking about the false dragons. And I don't feel like I've ever seen him. Um, uh, no, they ha we don't have them on screen yet. Okay. Somebody, somebody sketched him because I Googled him just to see if maybe he was on screen yet and had an actor. And, uh, somebody like put some sketch of Inktar for him. And they were like, this was my sketch of Mazarum. Yeah, he's from he's from um, the Borderlands as well. Okay. 
So he's, he's, uh, well, I can't, we can't really talk about him, uh, cause yeah. it hasn't really been brought up. I don't even think they bring it up towards the end of this, the season. No, I don't but, think so. Right. Uh, so I don't want to get into it too much. Uh, it's too hard for me to get into spoilers if I start talking about him a whole bunch. He's, he's oh, kind yeah, of important. Be a battle between the dragons battle between the false dragon and the real dragon okay yeah that's that's probably that's probably not a bad uh a bad hot take probably not bad yeah. uh because this is this is and the same mazram time as the guy that they mentioned at the end of season one like there's another false yeah. dragon in the south or whatever mm-hmm and it would make sense for the Forsaken to support this false dragon and or ally with him to hinder Rand. I'm okay. going to think on that for a little while. Okay. I like it. Uh, I don't know if I like this scene in particular just because Aes Sedai typically wouldn't be arguing with each other in front of their warders. As close as the warders and the Aes Sedai are, they don't typically um they don't typically let the warders like witness two Aes Sedai arguing with each other it's not it's not polite and i think they actually address it here in just a little bit uh also like elaine trying to decorate her room i was like well that's not that's not accurate and then we it gets fixed and makes more sense as you watch the episode um but here we have i think um Nynaeve is looking for Leandrin, and then I think she follows her down this tunnel. Um, I mean, none of this is like super relevant. I just, these are just slides that I took. Okay. Uh, I think maybe we passed something. The, What's that? A couple of things that I wanted to talk about. Um, okay. And it's a scene with Elias and Perrin, and I think it's probably right before this, or either right after this, before you see Nynaeve. And I think it was Perrin trying to invite Elias inside, and Elias was like, I would rather sleep out in the stars. Oh, was it after? Yeah, it's after. Okay, I'll, w I'll wait till we get to it then. Well, I didn't really have anything. Like, this is this is really like... I mean, this is just Nynaeve being confused and looking for Leandrin and then, like, sees Leandrin walking away really quick and then Nynaeve ends up in this secret tunnel following her. And then we cut over to this new town and uh, and then we get to the scene that, that you had uh, some notes on. Yes. So, uh, right there, that scene, that makes me... When I heard that... I feel like Elias is trying to warn Perrin of something. I feel like Elias has sniffed something out in the pack that he's in. Okay. It, or not the pack that he's in, but maybe the friends that Perrin's keeping around him. And he's just trying to say, they're, they're not the ones looking out for your best interest. You might feel like those, you know, are your boys. Um, but maybe not all of them are. So and is this uh, to prove my previous hot take? <laughs> is this your uh, Lord Inktar hot take? It is. It, I am gathering evidence currently uh, before prosecution. I'm I'm preparing my case. Okay. And this is one of them I'm gonna use. I feel like Elias. Well, obviously Elias has always wanted Perrin with them and to kind of join their pack, but I feel like. I don't know something just the way that i guess they they did this with body language it, to me it just seemed like elias is trying to tell him that just keep, keep an eye out man like just watch your back they're not they're yeah. not they're not your guys you know i agree don't, with don't that let your guard down i i agree that that's the that's the kind of the the body language that i got from this scene too is that elias is Maybe not warning him off, but just yeah. ba basically, uh, you you would do better out here. But I mean, is is kind of the the mood I got. 
or the impression I got. I feel that too. I feel like they also show a lot of shots of Elias and I feel like, like Elias sees maybe through some of the bullshit. Not that I'm saying there's anything going on, but I just, I feel like Elias is quiet and he's perceptive and he sits back and he listens and he watches. Right. right. I think that's, that's, that's just my perception of watching him. I think that's a good read. I, I get the same, I get the same feeling. I, uh, and I feel I like did... he's clearly looking out for parents' best interests. I think so too. I, uh, I'm curious, uh, do you have any thoughts on, on, um, like Elias's eyes are always golden, whereas parents kind of, uh, show up in, uh, times of like strain or something's happening. Like you, you already mentioned, we don't really have a, a good explanation in the show for what's going on. Do you have uh, any kind of, like, does that mean anything to you that Elias's eyes are always yeah. golden and his are not? Uh, for me, that just tells me that that's parents pappy, you know, as, as is, as is long long's daddy. Okay. Like, uh, not, future, not really. I'm just kidding. future um, mentor, maybe. I don't know. But, uh, but I have wondered that myself, you know, you see that and because you don't have a good explanation in the show i just i feel totally lost when it comes to this relationship between perrin and the wolf pack and elias i don't like it because it's so vague that they're not giving me a whole lot to go on you know like this this whole thing is supposed to be tied around the wolves where's the wolves right now why aren't the wolves involved you know why is it just perrin and elias um they, they kind of hint at a lot of things, like, you know, if the Asadai knew what Perrin was, that they would kill him or imprison him or whatever it was. But yeah, you just, for me, I have nothing to go on. Um, I don't know if they'll ever explain it. I mean, it, in general, wolves don't hang around villages, so... I don't I don't think they would be walking around welcome inside a village, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that could be that could be but an explanation. Oh, you mean like on the road or whatever? Well, yeah, I just mean at any point, you know, like within two episodes we're not seeing any involvement with the wolves. Maybe in right. the book it's a little different because there's more details and maybe when they're out on the road, wolves are there. I don't know those things. But for me, it's just confusing because it's like the wolves are your pack. Elias, from what I've seen from him, he's always with the wolves. Right. Um, now, all of a sudden, he's not. He's by himself and he's hanging around Perrin. So it's like, where are the wolves at? Your eyes are yellow. You're seeing the, the past. Like, what's going on? Uh, well, this it's just this, hard to kind of piece it together. This is one of those things that I, you know, like maybe the maybe the show thought one thing and they thought they could solve a, a problem or whatever, but they created another one because Elias doesn't, uh, doesn't fill this role as sniffer in the books. It's somebody else. So, so this, this could be like one of those things where, hold, hold on a second. My lights screwing up. So my my little lamp that I had over my monitor apparently only has a only has an hour and a half worth of battery. Yeah, that sucks. I think it's time to send that bad girl back. Uh, no, I think the for you. no, I think I can uh, lower the brightness. Like I don't think I need okay. much extra light. Like uh, the light's off. 
I don't know if it's like really obvious or not. No, not that I've noticed. I, I would didn't even notice until you said something. Yeah, I just I didn't want it flashing. Those it, it was like gotcha. I don't I don't want to have to like put a seizure warning or something on my on my video. Um. Yeah, this is like one of those things where the the solutions to their show their show writing might come back to bite them because if you're making this connection other people are going to make it too like who is this i mean you you know about elias from the book so you're making connections that don't really apply to the show because in the show we never see elias with wolves at least at this point the only wolves that we've seen were the ones that uh were with perrin right Uh, well, I mean, I was under the impression that whenever Perrin found Elias, Elias was hanging out with a pack of wolves. That's in the book. Uh, in the show. That's what I'm talking about. Like, in their first encounter in season one. I could be wrong. I could be mixing the book mm. and the show, but I feel I felt like that's what I saw in the show. I Maybe I'm wrong. I'm under the impression that this is the first time we see Elias. No. Elias is in season one. I that's why it's weird that he's the sniffer. I don't I don't know if that's true. Perrin doesn't recognize Elias at all when they when they're walking with him. I think you're tripping, man. I think you're you're overlaying what happened in the books. Really? Perrin does not see Elias until this episode. We don't we don't run into Elias at all. Whoa. Okay. Am I going through a butterfly effect right now? Um now, now I've gotta do some research. I gotta yeah. see what what episodes he was uh, in? I mean, I can, I can check, I can check my slides. But uh, I don't. Yeah, I feel like, uh, dude, there's no way. I don't think we've seen Elias at all. Okay. I'm, I'm looking through right now. Elias, he's in five episodes. Whoa. Because I, I feel like we talked about Elias last season. We talked about Elias because he's missing. Okay. Okay, so maybe, okay, maybe I'm getting confused some scenes in season two now that they've met and thinking that that happened in season one because that kind of happened in book one. Right. If that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. Well, yeah, that that's trippy, man. I, I like, would have bet my life savings that was in book one or season one nope that's crazy okay um so I mean, I really don't have anything else to to say about this. I we don't see any wolves yet. We we do hear like the wolves howling when he has that um, that weird vision of all the violence happening in that room, but that's about it so far. Yeah, I feel like me and you should have a conversation off screen about some things. Yeah, and involving Perrin. Yeah, because um, I don't, I don't want to ruin it for anybody else, but there's some questions I have. True thing. Um, okay. okay, so next thing I really feel like I, I saw a big plot point was in uh, Varen and 
Moraine's conversation here where they were talking about loopholes and oaths. Okay. This, the context of this conversation is basically Varen knows that Rand is the dragon and she knows that he's al alive, I'm pretty sure. Um, okay. Basically, she, she knows Moraine's secrets. And right. And Moraine is like about to pull a blade on this chick and dice her up. And that makes Varen feel good because she wants Moraine to be absolutely loyal to the dragon and the mission. Um, but Moraine was saying that she wanted her to make an oath. And Varen was like, girl, let's, let's not play this game. Like, you know things could change in the future. And you also know that there's ways around an oath. Right. And that made me think about just oaths I've seen taken like the oath rod that was done um, you know where she's banished from the white tower and that, that just kind of stood out to me and I also I think she called the dragon that Aiel man I think she was like I know the Aiel man's the dragon or maybe I'm, I'm you know Misremembering no, that, but I think that that was kind of the gist of what she was saying. I I don't think she necessarily knows uh, Rand's name, so I think you're I think you're right. I think she mentions him. Um, the, I know they talk a little bit about that, and they also mention like the like some prophecies or whatever. Um, yes. So. I I. This this scene. I just want to, I need to update my, um, I need to update my, my book scene count to, uh, three because this scene happens in the book, but it happens in like the first few chapters <laughs> yeah. and I forgot about it. So I thought, I thought the scene was really good. I also liked that Varen was, um, making sure that Moraine is dedicated. And I think, uh, given what happens between Moraine and Lan, I think Varen, this conversation kind of drives that point home to Moraine and kind of pushes her, um, towards that, towards that decision to kind of cut Lan off. I don't care. It's unbearable. <laughs> it's unbearable. I hate to watch it after all they've done to build up this bond between Warder and Asadai just to cut him by the wayside. I don't like it. You don't you don't like it? Does it I hurt? Like it. I don't like it. Does it hurt? It hurts me. I'm Good. hurting, Linda. I'm hurt. Good. You're supposed to hurt. I um this uh, next Might scene go is kind of faster. These last page of notes. Yeah, yeah, we're faster. getting we're we're getting towards the end. I mean, this is this is a scene where uh, the guy that scares the crap out of Errol is in Kyrian and Rand's kind of watching him, and I guess decides to follow him. And then I don't. That's about to get what know. he deserves. Yeah, I don't know if he killed him or not, and I tried to get a picture of him with using the power, but I, I got lazy and decided not to. No, I don't think he killed him. I think they said that he was attacked, and it's going to take him a few months to recover. Oh, okay. Oh, I mean, you can kind of see him, like, laying there breathing and moving. Oh, like, writhing around? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think so, too. And then uh, we got uh, Celine comforting comforting Rand and then they get kind of they get a little spicy there for a second this, this bitch, <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you mean he has nightmares what do you mean she's so nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean asking if he's got nightmares girl please <laughs> um this is a follow up to my when I when I watched the episode I mentioned that I was a little upset that Elaine was trying to 
decorate her room. And here we have uh, Shiryam basically scolding her for, like, you, like, who do you think you are? It doesn't matter if you're the daughter heir of Camelin. Like, this is the White Tower. You don't get to just decorate it however you want. Which is, oh, which is good character building. Yeah, I mean, it was, it's not, it's not book accurate, but it demonstrates a good point that, man, I really got to be careful where I pause. She looks like she's got a lazy eye on here. Um, but, you know, she takes the blame for the maid. Like, Shiryam gives her an out, and then Elaine is like, nope, it's my fault. And then she takes the blame and the switching for, what, three months is what uh, Shiryam said. Uh, so she's taking a punishment because she's the one that's responsible for us. Yeah, before yeah, she not no, not even a flinch. She she just said, "I'll take it." Yeah, and... we'll we'll see if she actually gets switched. Yeah, you you're gonna you're gonna switch, you're gonna, what is it, corporal or not corporal, but like yeah, corporal physically punishment. punish the future king or queen of your nation. Oh yeah, of yeah, course. You go ahead and do that. Of course she will. You you need to get that know. you need to get that far in the books, bro. She the White Tower doesn't give two shits about the the Andor throne. If you're a if you're a novice in the White Tower, you're suspect to all their rules. Like fair enough. Oh, I mean the oh, way it should be. I'm just saying. For me, yeah. Like, there's there's no <laughs> once she signs up. I'd be like, ah, no, there's no something out. I will say that the White Tower doesn't do blatant nepotism like that. Like they don't, they don't take uh, King's children. Like if Elaine couldn't channel, they they wouldn't let her in the they wouldn't let her in the tower, and they wouldn't let her. They'd let her train as a novice long enough to control her power, and then send her back home, and that's it. Uh, so no, no nepotism here. Shiryam is dead serious. She's gonna, she's gonna beat this girl <laughs> for months. Okay. Um, moving on. I feel like this scene gives Leandrin some, some more character development. I need to look and see what the next one is. Okay. So I thought this scene was really cool i thought that she had poured all of it in there to kill the guy which is basically what nynaeve thought um like to put him out of his misery i guess and i thought i thought all of this scene was pretty good you know i don't i don't remember anything like this in the book um it, it might not have just it just might not have been important enough for me to remember. I don't recall Leandrin having any kind of family that was still alive. I said I get pretty old and most of their family dies. Yeah. And and I think um like who did you think this man was? Who did I think it was? Yeah, does it does it say explicitly or or did or did you figure it out or what? Uh no, I I I figured it out later in the season who it was. At the beginning, I truly didn't know, but this was like, this is the kind of thing that I like. I like trying to figure these juicy bites out. So, I, yeah, I was on the hunt. I think it's his, her it son, season, right? Is it, her, is it her son? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Actually, she does say that. She was like, she holds his face, and she's like, my sweet my, boy, my sweet yeah, boy. Yeah, my, my sweet boy, yeah. So that's her son, right? Yeah, it is her son, yeah. That's uh, a good demonstration of, like, just how old... I guess they're trying to demonstrate how old the tower, how old the Aes Sedai are. Um, but anyways, Nynaeve tries to help, and Leandrin is not having that. Slaps the shit out of her, tells her to get out. As she should. Um, and then uh, I was, I mentioned that I watched the show last year, but I don't remember much. And this was, I forgot, I forgot that Min is at, is at the tower now. 
Oh yeah. I I forgot. I thought she was still in Faldara. Uh, no, this is, I, I like I like this plot line a lot. What um, Min Min and Matt? It's, it's gonna be fun to talk about. Yeah, Min and Matt and their uh, their days as prisoners together. Okay. I also like their two personalities together. Yes, I I think they do a pretty good job. Men and uh men and Matt don't don't meet a whole bunch in the books, but this is pretty much how I envision it. Yeah. And and I like how Matt doesn't want to know what she sees. She oh sees yeah. Her. That's also and also very book accurate. Men you could tell definitely has a prop with what she sees because she sees Matt stabbing Ren with the dagger. Um, yes, and I have a I have a problem with that too, or I did until I really thought about it, and we can we can kind of go into that when we get there. Um, no, because like what Men sees is true in the books like if men sees a vision and she can interpret what it means it's going to happen so that's like a very big plot point in the books so i was a little upset when i saw the vision and then i think i i think i pieced together a reason um of what men sees and why it didn't play out that way um so i mean we can talk about that I really do you, do you think it's better to go scene by scene or do you think when I watch when I pull these in do you think I should keep the character arcs together and go through them like Nynaeve Egwene and Elaine and then Moraine and Lan and then Rand and whoever he's with and Perrin whoever he's with like do you think it would be easier to just stick with like character arcs I think that might be a good way to go and it kind of helps speed up some of the stuff uh you know we can just bring up little points that we see throughout the uh through their arcs right it's worth it's worth trying you know and seeing if we like it better yeah maybe next maybe episode. it's not so, some of these episodes can get pretty pretty tedious like this episode there's not a lot of action but there's a lot of moving parts going on that are setting things up and putting things in motion yeah um and it, it's a lot of information to get through it is. Uh, I'm not even. And I feel bad because I feel like I could spend three hours on this. I mean, we're we're more than halfway there. Yeah, at... no, I'm aware. I don't have three hours to spend on this, but I I know that I could. Talking about all this information. Yeah. Um. So. I mean, I'll, I'll think about that for next time. Because when I take these, it doesn't matter to me how I organize them. I just put them in chronological order. Because to me, it's easier. It's just easier for me to do that. But I'm realizing as we're talking that we're kind of bouncing back and forth, uh, just like the show is doing. I think it might be easier to consume if we talk about like this is Rand's story arc in this episode. This is Moraine and Lan's story arc in this episode and then you know it, we we hit on the high points and move on and then we can come back later if we want to i, th I think that that's better because it yeah. allows us to get through the story much faster because i feel like with our current format we're being a little too tedious uh in that like scene for scene picking each thing out rather than covering right. an arc like you said and then it allows us time to give our opinion about what we think happened and, and where we think the thing, where the arcs are going to go uh, versus trying to dissect every single scene. And right. A lot of times, I mean, there's there's a good point in each scene, but like not everything needs to have a discussion about it. Um, I mean, you could have a discussion about everything, but I don't think it needs to. No, I, I don't think so either. I think it's... Um... I mean, the alternative to doing the, the character arcs uh, grouped together would be, like, if we see this, we just say, ah, let's skip this one. 
you know, because I, I don't have anything to say about, like, this scene, for example, other than it's a reference from the book and a reference from the prequel. And, you know, I like that they talked about it, but it's not really like a plot mover. Other than to set yeah. you up for, other than to set you up for what Moraine's about to do to Lan. Yeah, emotional damage, mass casualties. Yeah. Emotional damage. And I'm not a fan of it. If we move <laughs> on, never talk about Moraine again, I'm good with that. Aw, oh, come on, man. She makes a cool dragon at the end. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, now that, now that Min and Matt have, uh, teamed up, they apparently have made a gigantic hole in a very short amount of time. Uh, I guess, um, Men being from a mining dream village. Makes that dream work. I guess so. Uh, I don't know, but they they have a they have a pretty good in, like conversation with each other. Men like shares her wine, which means that you know she's being treated better than Matt is. And I didn't, um, I don't really have anything else to say other than like the. You know, she has that vision of Matt right before she gets out, and she doesn't she doesn't like what she's what she's seeing, but we don't we don't know why. Correct. She's just upset. Um. Okay. So. Much to add to that. Hmm. So, do you want to hear my my janky tie the book to the show? Uh, hot take. On why this vision is untrue, or why it doesn't come true. Sure. Um, so in this vision, Matt is holding the dagger and then stabs Rand. Right. Yep. So to me, the vision should have been, or no, the men's interpretation of the vision is, if you hold the dagger again. Rand will die. Like that's that's my interpretation, which is why the the vision doesn't come true. You know what I mean? Like that's my okay. that's yeah. that's my that's my hot take. Because if if men's visions always come true, then something about the vision has to be different for it to not come true. In this case, I don't think Matt ever touches it again. I think he like ties it to a stick or something. Yeah. Yeah. Spoiler. Whoops. No, that's a good point. Um, yeah. So here he is stabbing him. Apparently, I didn't do a good job of cropping this photo. Uh. Anyways, we're gonna gonna hop back over to uh, Rand and Celine. Does he say her name at all in this episode? I think so. <laughs> I think I so. I feel like he did. I feel like he did early on. Yeah, I think so. Um, anyways, they they get after it, and uh, she's talking about he's somebody that, um, that, you know, someone that she's remembering, and Rand is like, you're, I think about somebody that I'm trying to forget, and I thought that was an interesting bit of dialogue. Do we hear, do we hear about, we don't hear the name of who she's trying to remember. I don't think. No, that would give away who she is. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. She's just a lover, man. She's just a lover. Yeah, yeah here it is. is. When, when I'm with it's you, I can pretend you're him. Emotion. Yeah. Giving out rooms for, for Dick. Yeah, I'll have to charge you interest, I think she says at the beginning of the episode. <laughs> um, anyways, moving on, uh, you know, I, there's not there's not a lot with uh, with this scene with uh, Rand and Celine. They're just talking, basically. I don't, yeah. I'm not invested in it. I am invested in uh, Elaine and Egwene. Elaine makes some, some beer <laughs> with the with yeah, the one Lane power. Likes to tinker. Yeah, a that's tinker. a good. Uh, I'm glad you caught that. That was something that I that was I was gonna put it in the the title of the picture, and I forgot. 
bonding uh, time. Yeah, bonding time. Um, I do like how um, it seems to me that the show is trying to portray Elena as smart and uh, practical, like we see here, and kind of uh, almost a little mischievous. Um, you know, who you can pass this off as being, you know, like to tinker with the power, but ultimately it doesn't seem like Elaine is much of a rule follower. I agree. Um, so that that's what I gathered here. I think also uh, Nynaeve hears them talking. I'm not sure. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Nynaeve overhears this and gets all upset. And she then I want to get her feelings hurt. Yeah, she'll she'll be all right. She's not uh, the easiest person to get along in the first place. Oh, and this is where um, <clears throat> this is where we have the the ceremony, right? I think Leandrin grabs yes. her and takes her down downstairs. And I just want to point out that this is one of the scenes that is uh, other than the Aes Sedai saying the words. This is uh, straight up pulled right out of the book. Like all the things that she says, who who has come, um, you know, whatever the whatever the phrasing is for the ceremony, it's pulled right out of the book. It's I like it. That's a nice touch. I like that. Yeah. Should I do that a little more? Take it where we can get it. Yeah, I take it whenever I can get it. Um, I don't remember what the arches' um, description was. I meant to pull it up before we started, but I got lazy. Uh, but this is this is close enough. Um, I I wanted to look up the lore of it, uh, but one of the things I wanted to note, and I don't know if it's book accurate or not, but this looks like carved out of the out of the earth and like very rough, very rough looking. And I don't know if, like, how did they, how did they put these here? They didn't construct them. That's something that I, I do need to point out. I don't know if they'll address it in the show, but these weren't made. I thought they were brought there. Yeah, they were brought here. Okay, so you knew that. Okay. I thought they said that in the show. They, they I might mean, have. I, I wouldn't trust my memory after this episode, but <laughs> I'm pretty sure later they talked about in the show how they all do different things, and the these were like ones brought by like the founding sisters or founding somebody, something along those lines. I'm pretty sure. Mm, they're from the age of in the coming episodes. They're from the age of legends, so we'll yeah we'll see. Um, and then, oh, and then we get, um, break up. We get the breakup. And my only point here that I want to talk about is Land's statement here, but it takes eight Aes Sedai to cut someone off. And I think that's intended to be some sort of clue, personally. So I like I like looking for breadcrumbs. I think it feels good when I find one, and I think this is one. Okay. Um. In fact, I kind of want to go back to this. Um. The slides from when they cut Logan off. I want to see if they used eight people. I know they had a lot in there, but I don't know if it was eight. Okay. I found it. 56 slides is a lot, man. I... I grabbed a lot from the show this these last two episodes, like a whole bunch. Oh yeah. I mean there's a lot that's that's gone down. 
Uh, let's see, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Look at that, exactly eight. Imagine. That's where they uh, that's where they cut low gain off. One, two, three in the back, two on the side, two on the other side, and then Leandrin in the middle. Well, at least they're consistent, right? That's good. That's really good. Um, but you know, uh, Rishamayel did it just by himself. Uh, and here's your, here's your, uh, here's your heartbreak. I decided to, I decided to make sure it was as uh, painful as possible. I even called it breaking yep. of the fellowship in the title. She's so right. Can, because he's way better than she'll ever be. <laughs> I guess. Uh, I guess we'll never know since they uh, are not not talking to each other at all. I think she even like threatens to. Well, we'll find out in four or five episodes, but. Yeah, she threatens um, to give his bond over or to have uh, one of the other Aes Sedai take his bond by force. Uh, I need to I need to fact check some of this later on, because um, these are these are interesting statements. I need to go back and really look at what she's saying. Uh, okay. So I think we're getting pretty close to the end. We found the the Shan Chan. I thought this was a dream. I don't I don't know what you thought, but my first reaction was this is like a dream that that Perrin is in. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty shocking. I I mean I didn't think it was a dream just because I felt like they showed them kind of like waltzing into the city through the smoke. Oh, okay. Well, I just assumed that Perrin would have hurt him. Yeah, I mean, I guess, that's a fair point. You know, I guess I, that's... I was wondering that, too. Like, how they got into all the houses all at once without waking anybody up. Yeah. And in a whole city, there's not a single person awake at night to be like, Hey, guys. Intruders. Nope. Yeah, nothing. Not a dog. Uh, you could argue that fair the... Um, you could tar argue that the Suldam... Silence the the watch, the guards. True. Like very true. Um, okay, so we have uh the Sean Chan like pulling all these people out, and then we get to see. I don't care what you think about anybody, or think about the show, or think about the characters, or think about how they're not following the books. I don't care about any of that. This was a great fight scene. This gave me uh, f vibes from the movie 300 with Gerard Butler. This, this scene gave me, gave me uh, Leonidas vibes, and it was great. I can second that motion. I really enjoyed the fight scene. They, they do that. well at least with the, this group of characters when they can actually put hand-to-hand -hand combat they they do a terrific job yeah i like um i like ink tarts like i think that's called a glaive or something i have to look it up but he's using like a two-handed spear with a with a giant blade on the end that was pretty cool and then uh uno uno and ink tar like teaming up together and doing a pretty good job of holding their own and then um, I should have called this this next slide the ballerina man because I caught a picture of Loyal being like fierce, but it, the screenshot looked ridiculous. He looks like he's about to do a, a spin, like a ballerina move. Um, but we he's a he's a beast. Yeah, we see here that he's pretty strong. I think he like throws a dude like halfway across the town and into a wall or something. And they had like when Perrin first saw him, he had like four or five ropes on him. 
And I was concerned that they weren't going to depict just how uh, violent Loyal is or is capable of being, but I think they did a good job. They did a, uh, I think they did a great job here. It was impressive watching them take all those people on the way that they portrayed that. Uh, and then the party's over. Party's over because the the Suldaman over. the Suldaman and Demani show up and uh, knock everybody out. Uh, I would like to point out one thing, and it's subtle, and it's accurate, and it's important to me. It's important to me. It's not maybe not important to everybody, but it is important to me. When the Shan, when the Shan Chan ch take over somewhere, they don't typically kill people unless they resist to the point of, um, like, let's say they lose a guard. Okay, if they lose a guard, they're not usually too concerned about it. It kind of happens. But typically, if you don't resist the Shan Chan, they'll just round you up like this and make you swear the oaths and that's it. And like everyone's like, oh, the Shan Chan are awful. They're cruel. They're this, they're that. Look what they do to those women. Look at all these people in the background that have to carry the the pyramid or whatever. Uh, but overall, like, depending on which town is being taken over, a lot of them benefit from the Shan Chan. So, this is, this is their, like, they're used to this. They're used to just waltzing in and scooping up a town and putting them under their rule. And, uh, I think it's, I'm glad that they did this. They didn't show, like, the Shan Chan needlessly killing people. Uh, I don't know what your thoughts are on these guys, but... I was looking for very specific characteristics, and I think they captured that pretty well. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, kind of a shock. They look, uh, obviously very fearsome and tough. I think that, uh, we get a better look at them in the next episode, so whenever we start that out, I think we're gonna have a fun discussion about them. Okay. Um, but... Yeah, I mean, to me, it just looks like just looks like a uh, takeover, you know, a conquest. And yeah, that's kind of what they leave you with. Yeah. Uh, so we have uh, Ishamael, and then I can't remember her name. Um, I don't know if her name is important. I can't remember. I didn't. I didn't look it up. Uh, I did like that she's got this little hand motion going on, like she's not allowed to. Um, fidget or she has to like hold the pose out of respect uh for the high lady surath and uh you know uh whether whether i know any information about the show or whatever you know that doesn't it doesn't really matter but i did want to uh take a look at her and see see if there's any similarity from uh, episode one, because I think we kind of talked about it, and I just wanted to do a quick side by side. So this is where this is the scene from episode one. We've got kind of like a maroon with like the golden pleats on the side and green like the outfit is very distinctive okay so it's not one for one so what do you what do you think it's not the same outfit yeah i think it's her no i mean multiple pieces of clothing so that that to me isn't uh, a thing that's gonna stop her from being that character. To me, that's who I think it is. That's the only person I've seen with nails like that. So, okay, hot take. 
And then uh, we know this is uh, a bad dude. Well, I think yes. that's... Um, ah. I don't know why I took this screenshot. I don't, I don't remember why. It doesn't matter. Uh, but here we, here we go. The bad boy from season one. And I think Rand throws out Rand some kind lines. of. Yeah, Rand Rand throws out a line. Rand throws out a line like, uh, "I think I have more in common with you than the previous guy," or something like that. Yeah, I think I think it was something along those lines. Yep. Yeah, which I thought was nice. I, I like. I like where this is going. Yeah, me I, too. I like their little. Uh, <laughs> real relationship it's fun to watch I'm, I'm excited to get back into season two yeah me too um okay so are you are you ready for my uh my reveal i'm not gonna spoil anything but i wanted to give you the rest of my episode stats uh i just didn't want i didn't want to like give anything away while we were watching besides the dark friend count uh but here's See if I can get it all. Mm, dumb thing. Move that. There we go. So there's my there's my stats. Uh, I counted uh, six dark friends total, and uh, three of them were Black Aja, and two of them were Forsaken. That's that's my stats. So maybe maybe next episode if you're like keeping an eye out, like if you have any suspicions or hot takes or whatever, you know you don't have to like keep track I, of. I know it. who all three are right now. All I know, three. I know who all six dark friends are for a fact. For a fact, I know who they are. Okay, well let's let's go through it then. If you know, yep. I want to I want to so, hear it. We got we got the girl with the fingernails. Okay, that's High Lady Sorath. That High High Lady Sorath. It, it's either her or the girl next to her. Oh, that's fair. Okay. One of the two. Uh, it's the girl with the nails, cause yeah. So she's one. Uh, then you got uh, Leandrin. You okay. You have Ishmael. You okay. Have, ah, forgetting the forsaken name. I've been saying her name the whole episode. Lanfear. Um, land fear. Okay. So we're at four. Mm -hmm. Then, and I'm thinking it is the older lady who's gonna spank Elaine. Shirion. Yep. And one of the yellow Aja that Moraine's been hanging with. I feel like it's not Varen. I feel like it's Varen's sister. They're not sisters. Those those two aren't sisters. Those two aren't sisters. Okay. I thought they were sisters, but uh, uh, no, Adelius like could be. I, I feel like it could be the other, Aja that's not Varen, or Varen. One of those two. I feel like it's got to be one of those girls. It's got to be somebody at the white tower other than Leandrin. Well, and I'm curious why you think forsaken in the girl with the nose. I'm curious why you think Shiriam is Black Aja. Why? Yeah, why why Shiriam? Why the mistress of novices? She's in a position of power. I mean, I I, I mean that's fine. I'm just I gotta I'm just fit, trying. I gotta fit your six in there. I gotta fit your six in there. So I'm just trying uh, to pick up more of the Aja that that I saw. Okay. Well, that's fair. Could be the little apprentice but girl. I don't, we don't know. I don't. I don't know. I know. I said I know for a fact, but I don't. But those, those are the ones I'm going with. <laughs> <clears throat> okay well that's fair i uh i think those are those are good guesses and good hot takes and we'll just have to see we will 
Yeah. I'll keep uh I'll keep uh collecting uh data throughout the season. Yeah. Get my case together. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's. I think that was good. It was uh, maybe a little too long, and I think I think streamlining it with um, the characters grouped together if they're hanging out and having their pictures in sequence will let us get through this a little easier. Because there's, I feel like as we get closer to the end, we're either gonna have to figure out a way to speed up or cut out or break it up into two parts. So. We'll have to think on that together and figure out what we can do. Because two and a half hours is a long time. That's too too long for one episode. Yeah. yeah. We'll we'll figure out some ways to trim it down. We'll talk about it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm gonna shut the I'm gonna shut the stream down. Uh, thank you if you uh, watch in the future. I think the only people in the stream is uh, me and. Uh, and maybe uh, cheese it. I'm not sure. But uh, all right. Well, hopefully these hopefully these cuts give us something good. I'm a little concerned that my internet is going to make uh, some of this footage extremely unusable. So we'll see. But uh, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut it off. Are you gonna stay on Discord, or do you want me to? Do you want to call me, or what? Uh, I'll, I'll call you. Cause I've got okay. to switch over. Yeah, yeah, me too. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna shut it off. Thank you if you watched. Bye.